Well, NCA is now established under the laws of Kenya, CAP 499A, previously Act number 41 of 2011. The mandate is broad and uh, I would summarize it by saying it has three broad objectives. One is to advise government and industry on matters of construction. Two is to regulate the industry. And three is to build capacity, especially for the local contractors. Under these three broad objectives, there are specific mandates. And uh, what comes in mind to most people is the issue of regulation. Under this, we are empowered by the law to register contractors and skilled construction workers or site supervisors. That means that going forward, nobody is supposed to engage in construction without having registration by NCA, either as an individual or as a company. And then of course there's the issue of quality assurance. You know, historically we've had a lot of uh, challenges in this poor workmanship, collapsed buildings. And so the NCA was established to rein in on people who do shoddy work. And then of course there are other mandates like uh, research in construction, uh, training which ties up with capacity building. And then of course we are supposed to continuously advise the government on new methods, trends, technologies and any other construction related uh, information. We are supposed to also maintain a construction industry information system which is important in coming up with agendas for development as a country. Uh, you know construction today is one of the industries with a double digit growth. In terms of um, employment, it is estimated that it, it employs about 11 to 13 percent of the workforce in Kenya, either directly or indirectly. And in terms of uh, growth, it, is, it grows at about 10 percent per annum. And so it is important to have these statistics or data so that the government can make programs which are geared to development, bearing in mind the data that the industry has. Yeah. Of course, besides that, uh, the NCA also has a big uh, mandate in ensuring that uh, the public gets uh, quality buildings, quality construction projects. And so it is in line with this that we are, we were established to broadly oversee the industry and uh, ensure that it is developed. We have about 22,000 in our database. Um, 22,000 contractors. They fall in various classes. Roads, buildings, energy, waterworks, and various categories. Category one being the highest. That means those with capacity to undertake works without financial limit to category 8. Now, when I came to NCA, I realized that the government agenda was to encourage many people, especially the young people and women, to join all sectors of the economy where they could be self-employed. And so we introduced a category called category 8. Category 8 is specifically for people who are starting up in construction. We give them a chance to come in, we register them, we ask for the very basic requirements with the intention of training them. We realize that if we don't do that, they'll still engage in construction outside our umbrella. And so it is deliberate that we have this category 8, which ironically now has most of the people. So out of the 22,000 contractors, what we'd call the lower categories, category say 5, 6, 7, 8, constitutes about 80%. Of the, of the contractors, which means that we have a huge task in capacity building so that these guys can eventually be given uh, training and uh, they can be supported in terms of equipment and eventually hope to grow to the higher categories which are one, two, three mainly. 
uh, I would say that the industry has responded very well. I would say that this is one industry where compliance today is at 100%. And that is, that has not come easy. It is because of the deliberate designs we put in place to ensure that procuring entities give us support in ensuring that they do not engage people or persons who are not registered with NCA. And so, registration by NCA is a prerequisite even in pre-qualification and that has given us a boost in terms of numbers. We are now engaged, we have now engaged on the second mandate which is registering skilled construction workers. We hope to have a database of 2 million persons in one year. On this we are very ambitious and we hope that in, in, uh, in uh, six months we should have at least a million people registered. Already we are also undertaking due diligence because you realize it is not possible to ascertain the correctness of information given by 22,000 contractors. So what we've done, we've sampled, sampled all category ones and now we have inspectors and a team empowered by the law who are visiting contractors offices to ensure that what they wrote in their documents is actually what they have in their yards and this is what we are calling due diligence and we hope that we will issue certificates once we are satisfied that the registration corresponds to the actual capacity you see the advantage we have is that uh, Unlike what people think, construction companies, especially the big ones, eh, are run very professionally. Uh, they've got most of the directors are well versed with the laws of the land. Being in construction actually essentially means you understand the law. To be law contract, maybe may it be arbitration. And so what we have done, we have engaged stakeholders. In the last one year, we have continuously engaged stakeholders right from the contractor federations, professional associations, other government agencies, and we have developed tools which have been accepted by the industry. Besides that, we have also developed our regulations, which are just about, which are now for the House, the National Assembly, and which are about to be passed. Now, the regulations, coupled with the fact that they have been stakeholder born, and the fact that we have a very good act will definitely ensure that compliance is adhered to. Besides, the penalties as spelled out in the act are very stiff. I don't think anybody really wants to go, go, go behind the law and not adhere to the provisions as they are. But having said that, we also, de uh, depending on the goodwill of the public, and. Uh, we are telling the public or urging the public that first, as a, as a starting point, don't engage persons who are not registered, even in your own private constructions. Now, that will do one thing. It will ensure that people who want to work in any gainful employment must seek registration. And once you come and seek registration with us, then you'll be required to sign a code of conduct, which you must adhere to. So in a way, we are trying to professionalize the industry. And uh, in so far as we are concerned, we have done very well on that front. Well, with 22,000 contractors in, the, in my database, I can tell you it's very positive. When I came in, I was told there are 6,000 contractors. Today, I have 22,000. It means that even previously, they were not respecting the previous uh, administrative exercises of registering them. The fact that we have got 22,000 contractors in our database and we continuously get new applications on a daily basis means that uh, they are willing to comply with the law. But as I told you, it's about them understanding that this is good for them and that it is easier to comply than not to comply and that you cannot do business without having compliance. So in a way, I would say that uh, it's been accepted. We have got a, a stakeholder forum. We realize that as, as a national construction authority, we cannot do it alone. We must engage all persons involved in construction. And so we've engaged the professional sessions, we've engaged NEMA, we've engaged the county governments, the contractor federations, and ourselves. When it comes to issues of quality assurance, it is not just 
the authority. It starts from the design, the professionals, the supervision, the local government or the, or the local authority that is involved. And so we are developing a, a tool, a common tool, which will ensure that enforcement is adhered to. Previously, construction has been disjointed where everybody does his own thing. But now, we have realized that we, we, have, we must bring this to one roof, under one roof. And that is what we've done with this uh, standing committee, which has been there for about six months now. And we've developed uh, uh, rules, which have now made us have a code of conduct. So going forward, it's going to be a common, it's going to be a, we're going to pull in one, in one direction as, as an authority, as regulators, industry, and the county governments. So um, we've seen it work in other countries and we've borrowed from best practice. And I'm sure uh, given the support that we are getting already, it's definitely going to work. Now we have, we have addressed that specific issue in the regulations. We are saying that going forward, all foreign companies can only be registered as NCA1. That means they can only do the big projects. And even then, they must subcontract or go into joint venture with the local partners at a minimum of 30%. Now, NCA2 to NCA8 will be only left to local companies. That means that if you're a foreigner, you'll not be allowed to do the small jobs that locals are entitled to. So that has been addressed adequately in the regulations, which are before the House today. We have also discussed with the Parliament on that, and we've agreed that even those jobs, eh, there should be a provision that there's local participation at a minimum of 30% through subcontracting, either through direct labor or through um, joint venture. And we're also saying that even the local materials, even, even materials should be sourced locally. So that is before the House for consideration, but um, we have had meetings and it has received very positive uh, response. That is uh, a misconception. In other countries it has worked. And uh, we've, we've, we've had an advantage of seeing what other people have done. And not only in construction, in many other countries, uh, even when you want to start a factory, they always insist that there must be local participation sometimes even at, at 50%. So I think if we make deliberate efforts, and that's why the NCA is there, if the, if the local contractors don't have capacity, then we build capacity to them. We can build capacity in them by giving them guarantees or by encouraging them to come together as local partners and form consortiums so that they can participate in at least the minimum 30% thresholds. signing uh, an agreement with the uh, housing finance to train to help train a million artisans but, but at NCA we are also having a curriculum where we are going to put deliberate efforts to team up with village polytechnics and TVETs eh, so that we can train the artisans uh, we are more interested with the artisans they I believe that uh, we have enough engineers in this country we have enough architects we have enough uh, country surveyors and construction managers. What we need is what we call the bottom of the pyramid. But we're also having a second initi initiative where we are, we, are, we are now going to have a system where we test skills based on competence, where we will give certificates to people who did not go to school or do, who do not have formal education, but who have gained experience by way, of, by, by way of working on the job. This has worked very well also in places like Tanzania and in South Africa, where we are going to recognize prior learning through experience give you certification, then try and bring you up with time. And really that's where the problem is. If we are able to address the bottom of the pyramid, then the issues of construction standards will be dealt with once and for all. Our universities train the top cadre, but what we need is the bottom, so that the bottom can match the top, and so that we can have a perfect pyramid. Today the pyramid is upside down. We have more engineers, architects, the big, you know, diploma and above, fewer than the artisans, especially in construction. 
We also, as a, an authority, going to start our own institute, the National Construction Institute. Uh, we already have board approval. We want to model it along what we saw in Singapore. The reason is that unless we have one of our own, then we can never act as a benchmark for the industry. There's a tendency for universities and colleges to train courses which are profit-oriented. We realize that construction courses are expensive to train and many people may not be attracted to them. So we are starting our own institutes, one in Nairobi and ten in the regions. Uh, we're going to collect a construction levy, you're aware. There's a construction levy. Most of the money from the levy will be used for training. And so we are going to finance the programs across the country. We have identified 680 village polytechnics. No, 680 village polytechnics, 45 technical institutes, and two technical universities, which we are going to work with. These are spread out across the country uh, in every constituency. So we are going to have deliberate programs with them. I have MOUs with them, memorandum, understanding, and finance them in training our people. Yes, it will be. From our estimates, of course, of course, money is never enough, but we, we must be realistic and uh, progressively budget for what we are able to, to, to achieve. So initially, what we are able to collect in the first two, three years will be sufficient for this program, at least. But don't forget, the more we train them, the more they go out, work, and pay as levy. So it's a, it's a catch-22. Unless you invest, you will not reap in two, three years. So for us, it's a question of investing now in these uh, programs. Next year, we are talking of 4 billion. Next year, 2014, 2014-2015, 4 billion shillings. This year, you will realize that uh, uh, I, I was alone. You know, I, we just hired our new staff. They reported in January. So we've been operating with the attached staff from the ministry. So we, didn't, we weren't really full, fully operational, but now we are. Uh, going forward, we need annually about 4 billion. So we already have county offices. We have one in Kisumu, one in Nakuru, one in Kitui, one in Mombasa. In fact, in yesterday's papers, if you noticed, there was an advert where we put an advert saying that certificates can be collected. We even gave contacts of those, of those uh, county offices. Before the end of the financial year, we'll have six others in all the traditional provincial headquarters. That's before June. As I told you, we've continuously engaged stakeholders. I think there's no other authority that has engaged stakeholders like us. We have directly reached out to 20,000 stakeholders directly. Before we took the, the regulations to Parliament, every contractor in this country had a copy of the, of the regulations and the Act and was sensitized on this provision. Of course, anybody who pays a tax wants to see that it's used correctly. That is their right. And for this, we, have, we, have, we are subject to audit by the National Audit Office. We also have audit by the Oversight Authority of the Parliament. So for us, what we're saying is, let's collect the levy, let's run our programs, and then we'll be judged at the end of it all. We cannot, pre we cannot pre preempt something that has not Okay. We've not even collected a shilling yet, and we're already running, and we're already doing things, mainly based on goodwill from the industry. We've received a lot of support from the industry by way of sponsorship. In, our events have been fully sponsored. When we have an event, it is fully sponsored. Of course, we know that these people have commercial interest, yes, but at the end of the day, that's the way to go. That you, must, you must engage industry and, and the manufacturers, because we are all we all have the same goal. Our minister has been very supportive, our peers. Uh, the high offices are very supportive of this initiative because they understand that unless we have a strong regulator in the industry, then all the gains that we are trying to do will, not, will come to naught. Uh, also, we've got a lot of support from other quarters, uh, the professional bodies, 100%. Uh, we are continuously engaging them, we are continuously participating in the events, or they participate in our events. So far we've been very good at a lot of support. Kenya today is one of the countries where we still have biggest need in housing. Uh, 
in Nairobi alone, 60% of our people live in what you would call inadequate housing. Our infrastructure still needs a lot of attention. So I don't see this industry being saturated, at least not in the next 30 years. That I can tell you for free. Our population is growing, our middle class is expanding, and people need facilities, they need homes, they need schools. I mean, if you go to a typical school, public school today, you'll find uh, the classes are full. So there's still a lot of room for expansion. Probably what we don't have is money to expand. But that's why we are now, as a government, coming, coming come up with new models of project delivery. But I can assure you that until Vision 2030 is attained, we don't have enough yet of construction. And so, and don't, and don't forget that construction is not limited to buildings. Buildings are a very small aspect. We have energy. We have the 5,000 megawatt project coming up. We have dams. You know, we have waterworks, sewage works. This is it's all the construction. How many towns in Kenya today are seaward? Very few. So until they're all seaward, we cannot say that there's a, a, boob, a, a bubble going to burst. What may happen is that the industry may shift priorities, probably from developing of high-class residential to maybe middle class. But bursting of bubble, I don't see it happening, not any time, not, not in our lifetime at least. If you look at developed economies like the West or even the East now, the Far East, construction has gone on for more than a century, continuously. Uh, China today is a developed country, it's the second biggest economy in the world and construction is still going on every day. So construction is a key aspect of development and even when we develop we'll bring down old buildings like this one and put up new ones. So it is an industry that will continuously expand. We are building capacity. Our establishment will be 900 people across the country. Half of who will be professionals in the industry. Already as we are talking, we have hired some of the top brains in construction. We have about 40 managers now in construction. By the end of the year, we'll have 220. In three years, we'll have 900 people across the country. I can assure you that with 900 people in this country, my friend, I don't know what other capacity you're talking about. Capacity is not something you, 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 you pick from the street, you build it. And that's what I'm doing right now. I started, with, I, this company, this authority started with me as one person. Now we are 40. In another two months, we'll be 100. End of the year, we'll be 220. So we're building capacity deliberately, selectively, and very effectively. Uh, you see some of our engineers here, the ones we've picked are some of the best guys in this country today. And so we know that that is an issue, but we're building it. But it is a tie to available resources. To get good engineers, you need to pay them well. And so we are waiting to collect the levy so that we can expand our capacity. But we are also looking at other initiatives. Of course, we talked about stakeholder involvement. We are also looking at use of technology, ICT, in monitoring and uh, evaluating projects. I just came from Brazil where I noticed that uh, the Brazilians use drones to monitor the industry. Who says we can't get there one day? So I think we should not be skeptics about this. We should be positive and uh, help the NCA build capacity adequately. Nothing is easy in the world. Uh, of course, initially we thought there was going to be resistance and there was. But uh, then it is a question of understanding your threats and creating opportunities for them. Uh, when, we, when we realize this is going to be a difficult thing, we, we do a strategy that counters it. Uh, of course, we know that there will be resistance to paying levy, there will be temptations to underdeclare or uh, evade. But you see this, we are going to work with KRA, who have experience in collection of levy or taxes. And so for every threat, we must we have a, a counter to deal with it. And that's how we, we, we are looking at this whole thing. NCC died because of many reasons. One. It was meant to Africanize construction. And so, Africanization meant, meant giving black people 
opportunities. And uh, he did this by giving them projects and financing them. So it had weak internal systems in uh, monitoring and implementation. And then of course there were management problems, weak management problems. Uh, there was political interference. And so that is why it collapsed. Now, 30 years later things have changed. Uh, the country is more democratic. Uh, people are now more enlightened. The industry is more responsive. The industry is already Africanized. So that uh, so the issue of the, the challenge now is not Africanizing the industry. That was the challenge at that time. The challenge now is to with these Africans you have, how do you build capacity to them? So we are different we have a different objectives. In fact, NCC's objective was to capacity build the African. That is just a one line item in our objectives. We are we are doing much more than that. So uh, we don't see ourselves failing because, uh, as I told you, we're in a new era. We're in a new, completely new era. And uh, our stakeholders understand our mandate and they're willing to support us. So I can tell you that uh, contrary to what you think or what people think, this, this will be one of the most vibrant authorities in the next 10 years. It will be one of the strongest authorities, not just in the country but in the region. It will be very respected, to be like KRA. And my objective is to build it to a level where it's like KRA, most respected, the only reference point in matters of construction. We are left as we are. In fact, it means that even the leadership understands our mandate is unique. So we are still left intact. We are not, we are not uh, due for review or for restructuring. To be the reference point, NCA to be the reference point on matters of construction. When somebody thinks of anything to do with construction, first calls here. That will have achieved. The industry will obviously grow uh, much, much more. But we want to see it more coordinated and uh, issues of quality really addressed. And then, of course, my passion is in capacity building. Ensure that the small guy who registers today as class eight, in five years' time, is class three. He's doing. A, pro a project like this. That's, that to me, I have achieved a lot. There's, there's a, the normal bureaucracy in government, but uh, I call it a very necessary evil. It must be there for systems to run. But I'm also lucky because when I came with the authority, I was the only one here. So I had a, a latitude to shape things the way I thought. I didn't come into a system that was already, you know, bloated or blog, bogged down by a bureaucracy. So my experience may not be the real experience because it was a new thing, I was the only one. And so I was setting the standards as it were. But uh, I will tell you one thing about government. First of all, what I've learned is that government has some of the best brains in every industry. Uh, my colleagues in the government whom we co work with on a collaborative aspect are some of the best in engineering, you know, in construction, you know. I think the link, the missing link has been how to tap these best brains for effective delivery of services. Uh, I think my honest view is that uh, the very good brains we have are underutilized. They're just underutilized. They're, they're not given the opportunity to exercise um, their capacities. Uh, I think maybe it may be because of maybe constraints in finance or something, but Given a mandate, given a, prog a program, they're very good guys. Actually, the best I've seen. Yeah, better than private sector. Yeah, they're very knowledgeable. They're very well trained. But I think resources have been a, a hindrance. So you find that somebody doesn't have a lot of work to do. But then the rest is uh, we learn as we move on. We learn a new, new things every day. Yeah, it's a new learning environment. You learn about procurement issues. You learn about government ethics, you know, those kind of things.